But the way and the reason why I always use it is because in Puerto Rico, puñeta became a symbol. It's this symbol of resistance and this symbol of celebration. And it's also a symbol for when you're really angry. So I usually, and I think puñeta is the summary of what I do with my work and also the way I approach my design and approach the way I teach, right? So uh, that's me and my stereotypes. Uh, <laughs> You heard before, I love gradients and I love shiny things and I like to embrace all the stereotypes that I want to reclaim and that I want to reappropriate and be, be I'm proud of them, right? I'm proud of my plantains, I'm proud of using Bix for anything that needs to be solved in your life and I'm proud that Ricky Martin, everyone knows Ricky Martin <laughs> uh, and also I'm really proud of these aesthetics that uh, people and I used to consider ugly and I felt bad saying that because this is the stuff that I used to see in my house. But then after getting a design education, I'm like, I, I became a little snobby and I look at my house like, oh, that's so ugly. And then I, now I look back like, wow, you, you, that, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> and that, I'll talk more about that later. So, but first I would like to start to see how, uh, how I am approaching decolonization as an individual pro process. And for this, I thank a lot Dori Tonstall. She is the dean of the OCAD in Toronto. And she, when I met her, she told me that to start the colonizing, the first thing that you need to think about is what is your relationship with the land? With the land that you're standing in and with the land that you come from. And then once you think about that, the first thing is like, how do you protect your own culture and your language? And your and language meaning the speaking, the written, spoken, and also your visual, the visual language that come from that land. Uh, and then, so I think it, to me, it's always it has been really important to keep decolonizing who I am and my practice in order to participate in things that include a bigger scale, a bigger community, and at the end to decolonize my island, right? Which is one of the goals that I would love to see before I'm not in this planet. <laughs> So I'll start talking about some categories that I'm working with. I'll show some of my projects inside these categories, and then I'll show you what I'm doing with my students in my decolonization class. So the first couple of categories that I'm working with is identity and these so-called heroes or role models that I always have, and how do I approach these two concepts with design projects, right? Um, my, my main goal is to, with my design, is to create a space where black, indigenous, and people of color don't have to choose between design and identity, right? Like, it's always this, in my life, it's always this, like, I have to choose, like, I'm going to do design that has nothing to do with identity, or I'm just working with identity. Why do, I, why do black, indigenous, and people of color have to do that? And those, these narratives that I create with my design are trying to challenge that. Uh, the first one uh, is called Aromatizantes, and what I did is I, I created this collection of what people hang in their cars, because I was, <laughs> to me it's really, make, making that decision of hanging something in your rear view mirror is like, this means something to you, this is important. So I collected images and all that, and, I, and then I was thinking, what is the shape that is the most common? And I was like, oh, I remember my dad putting the, the small tree that smelled like, I don't even know, the, the fakest thing that you can smell in the planet and then open it all the way and the dust smell will like 
uh, are, well, they stay there for a year. And then I repopulate these shapes with the images that I found. And I created these new shapes that I then put inside the bag again. So I open the bag a little carefully and put them all back inside the bag. And then I left them in the store, <laughs> which, which at the end is a little bit harder than stealing because I was so like worried like putting something back in. I don't know what happened with this. There's no, I, that wasn't my intention. If someone tried to buy it, I have no idea what happened at the register, but I hope they got it right because <laughs> they wasn't going to scan. So that's what, like I was challenged in thinking about identity. And then I move on to an experience that I designed that I wanted to play with cultural identity and all the stereotypes that were following my cultural identity. So I wrote down the seven more important aspects of my cultural identity. And working with this uh, uh, coder, we developed this website where you have to answer questions for each one of those uh, categories. And at the end, it, calculate a new answer. And it's, it's all like ironic and a satirical way of looking at cultural identity. So all that word, that new name that, I'm, that the system is giving you, it makes no sense. But the way it's built, it's based in all your answers. Like each one of those letters is drawn from, all, from the answer that you gave the machine. And then people could print it and take it home and be really proud of their new nonsense name. Uh, so that was it, that was one, and moving from there, I started uh, thinking, moving back to religion, and how religion was a big part of my childhood, and I always think it's like, it was a force that colonized me, and it took me years, especially to, when talking about my sexuality and my gender, how do I be colonized for all this power that was shared when I was growing up? And that's, I think that's a th something that will take my whole life to do, because it's at that intense, because I grew up in a Protestant slash Catholic house. So, but then I decided like, how to reappropriate and take these images that were so strong and I hated so much when I was growing up and start designing with them. What kind of narratives can I do with that? And the first one I did was a website, and this is a little video, and then I'll explain to you why it works that way. Maybe the video is not there. Not there so I was thinking, uh, I, how do I pray? And how do I translate praying into a digital format? And I think I, when I'm praying, I'm going from top to down. And I'm like scrolling down. That's how I pray when I'm remembering. And then I was like clicking is the amen, I'm done. And then I, I wanted to create this visual image that is a combination of stereotypical Latin uh, Virgin imagery and stereotypical EUS pop culture imagery and create these small post postcards that included both. So it was up to the user to decide which one they're going to get. And then there was a huge collection of all of them. And you will print them and also take them home with you if you wanted to. So that's like when I was exploring and reclaiming all this visual imagery and everything that has to do with religion, then I started building, if you speak Spanish or listen to Spanish music, you probably know who this is, which is Juan Gabriel. And I started building this digital altar instead of a physical one to pay, to play, to pay homage to one of my favorite artists. And it's just all the aesthetics, everything that he said, and how do I do a gift that works as an altar to some, someone I admire. So that was the process that I was going through when talking about identity and people I admire. I don't want to call them heroes. As long as I stay away from the he pronoun, I'm happier. And so then after that, thinking about Dory Tonsa, like I mentioned before, this idea of protection, how important it is to protect something, and what is, your, what is my role and everyone's role in order to protect something. Right? And protecting, not in the sense of like embracing and like encompassing something, but how do you use your privilege to do that, to protect languages, to protect visuals, right? And not only in a, in a physical way. Uh, and one of the first projects, which 
this one is on the works because music always changes. But this is the book that we use in Puerto Rico when we are learning how to read. Yeah? Everyone that goes to public school has seen this project before. So I was, I was always really drawn to the visual language of this. And I decided to mix it. I, this is how it looks inside. It's really funny. It's just like, me, my mom, me, ama, which is my mom loves me. But then I'm like, what can I do with this? And I started thinking on reggaeton. And how reggaeton is, <laughs> how do we, how do, how, do, how do I play with a music genre that has been forbidden in the island but now became the biggest representation of what the island is musically? So what I did, I, I'm, every time I'm listening to reggaeton, I'm taking, writing down lyrics and I'm put, putting them in the new cartilla, which is a cartilla that says people want reggaeton music uh, and then when you open it, <laughs> So the lyrics now, the image stay the same, but the lyrics are drawn from reggaeton songs. So if you speak Spanish, it could be a little controversial, but it's, a, it's, a <laughs> it's my way of also like keeping this, these two languages that have been really important in my childhood and in my teenage years, and putting them together to create a new visual form. Uh, so, and then from that, then, so that's more, more samples. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still repopulating this because reggaeton is going through a new moment where now we're listening to trap. So I'm, and that's a new genre of singers. So I'm extracting now lyrics from those singers in order to finish this book, which has been more than two years collecting songs and changing the lyrics so I can finally print it. Uh, and then nothing, uh, stop things started to change last year after Maria hit the island and he created, devastated so, so many things and unrepairable damages. And I was here, that was the moment I moved to San Francisco. And I remember the day that Maria hit the class was when I started teaching. And I just blanked out. I couldn't talk to the students because my mind was in the island. And after that, this, it just, everything started, my whole, the way I approach design started shifting. And I always talk about this, uh, quote and how important it is because it's that that's the way I, I feel when I was the, the way I see a lot of Puerto Rico right now and the way I see my family and it's just how they have validated the way colonialism works right and they, and they cannot see an island where colonialism is not happening and that to me is really sad and that's something that I want to change and I use and I think visual language has the power to work with this and to influence this, this way, changing this way of thinking. Um, so yeah, and then, so that being said, then I started approaching everything more into resistance and celebration, right? Because not, I was really, really sad when after Maria, but I'm like, okay, we're resilient people and we love celebrating. How do I use this resistance as a way of celebration and celebration as a way, so as a way of resistance? And how does that become part of my practice? So these are my family. That's me on the yellow shirt. So, and these people are like people that are always, always celebrating something. Even though they're working nonstop, but they always have something to celebrate. And these are the people that say puñeta a lot. And then these are the people that say puñeta a lot. In Puerto Rico, when, when we win some sport internationally, people scream puñetas. Like, yeah, we won. And then, by looking at that, then more important was this person here, which is my grandmother. And my grandmother right now is my first step into decolonizing the aesthetics and the visual language that I use in my practice. And the reason why I do that is because my grandmother uh, grew up in the mountains. She doesn't know how to read or write. She never learned. And when you go to her house, the decisions that she makes design-wise she buys everything on the 99 cent store. And then she makes it, she, she just put her house with, with just intuition, what she thinks is beautiful. If you just go to her house, she has a wall that is just pictures with tape. There's no frames, it's just pieces of tape everywhere. And I just thought like, wow, this, like, she's doing this based on intuition, and I wonder if I, this is the beginning of me decolonizing what I learned my whole life, right? When I went to the science school, what my grandma has in her house, to design school, I was like, that's horrible. That's what I learned in school, right? Everything that she's doing is ugly, that's not how you do it. 
modernism says another thing. Everything needs to be simple, and even anything needs to be clean in order for it to work. And I'm like, how do I decolonize from that? And, and from this practice that just, it was with me my whole life. Like, I always say like modernism colonized my way of approaching visual communication. And now I'm going through this process of decolonizing from modernism and Eurocentric perspective in design, like right? what is considered beauty and what's not. So the first project I did was uh, to build, yeah, yeah. so my new inspiration is how do I create a conversation between modernism and my abuela? And how does that help me decolonize my practice, right? The first uh, project I was working with uh, was this exhibition that I want to give a shout out, a shout out to my friend Makia that helped me a lot with this and the installation. And I built this. I went back to this idea of altars, and we I built this altar that pays homage to the word puñeta, which is these symbols of resistance and celebration. And so that's how it looks. It's an altar using materials that cost me 99 cents in order to design something that, that is part of an exhibition, right? And all these flowers that I used to see when I was growing up in my mom's house and my grandmother's house. So I call it like 99 cent aesthetics. And so I was working on that. And then after that, I had the opportunity. And this is where I moved to my favorite part, which is my student's work to design a decolonization and design class. So the, the most important, a lot of important things in this class. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it came from this constant fight with modernism that I just mentioned. And that, me fighting with that, and then my country's and my family's aesthetic. And I also wanted to tell my students that, I, I, when I, was just, I hated when people told me that I need to overwork myself to be successful. I just thought that was so, so bad. And I'm like, I, can, I need to change this way of thinking. Because it's not fair that, because I get to sleep, you're telling me that my work is my me work. My work is not good enough. And I wanted to, to, to uh, put that into my class as well. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because my family overworks themselves in order to survive, right? And then I have the privilege of saying like, oh my god, I'm overworking myself because designers do that all the time. It's like, that is so unfair when there's people that have to actually work nonstop in order to survive. And I wanted to bring that into my, my curriculum. And so the class was divided in three parts. The first one was food. And this part, the students work as a group, in three different groups. And they developed this, designed these scenes that talk about a particular aspect of food before and after Maria hit the island. The interesting part about this class is that when the class started, no one knew where Puerto Rico was on the map. So the class, I have to, the moment the class started, I have to reevaluate my curriculum and change it to do history, politics, and design. So it was a lot of reading, but it was a lot of fun. And these are some of the projects. So someone, fo a group focused on the political politics of Rome and how Rome was something that was never grew in the island and the U.S. imposed on the island and they wanted that to be the new economics of the island but then they found a new place where they can get cheap labor and they let everything there to perish and be abandoned. Uh, so they were working on that and they, have some, they were doing a lot of research and they were like quotes like this, this kind of quotes just changed their way of thinking. Uh, they were taught to produce what they don't consume, and they were taught to produce what they to not not to produce what they consume. Because they, all the students were surprised that in Puerto Rico, uh, uh, around 80% of what we consume comes is imported to the island. Because it was a moment where the U.S. decided that Puerto Rico was going to be an industrial island, and they built pharmaceuticals and buildings, and they wanted to they forgot about agriculture. And that's really bad because when Maria happened, we, we had no communication for two weeks or more, but at least telecommunications. And how do we get any food delivered when we're in the middle of the ocean if we're not allowed to communicate with anyone in the world? So that's, it just woke up now, it's like waking up people who are like, hey, we need to produce our own food. Uh, so they were working with politics of, of, uh, of runs, with the problem with the GMOs in the island. And then from there, we move, they move into music. And they were talking, analyzing music 
from understanding and then analyzing. Really important from this, all the concepts that they are learning as, as a group, then they apply in individual projects, which is comes after. So in music, we have people that, this is, yeah. So people were working with this group, this partnership was working with Salsa Music and they wanted to, they were really impressed by how, uh, how do you say that, machista the Salsa Music is? Yeah, like a uh, macho, so like sexist, yeah, like a sexist and they wanted to shut up the male singer and empower the female singer. So they gave out this gift and then it became a poster with the lyrics of the artist and the one for the Hector Lavo is all distorted because they don't want me to read that and the one from Celia Cruz is like beautiful and it's just empowering what she's saying. Uh, then we have, let me see who comes, uh, then we have some people play, paying homage to what uh, Hibaro music is and this is the music from the people, the people from the mountains and so it just, they were playing with it, creating a visual language that feels a little, that's talking to a more new generation, but still talk about how important the Hibaro music is. And they also develop, uh, I, I skip, okay, that, and then, okay, that's playing. Then this other group was working with Plena, and the same, it was all about, they were learning so much about it that they wanted to show how empowering the music is to Puerto Ricans. That's the main goal that we got from working with music. Because to Puerto Rican music is like the way we just like feel so happy. When you're sad, when you're cleaning, when you're partying, music, music, music. And I know it sounds like a stereotype, but the moment I arrive to the island, there's reggaeton somewhere. Somewhere, always. So the, and then this person also created, in the past, we had this periodo cantado, which will tell narratives, and so they reappropriated that form and they use uh, plena lyrics, but they changed the lyrics to talk about stuff that was happening in the island and a little bit of what they learned, talking about history, talking about the weather, and talking about music. And they, they printed and the, and the risograph at school. Then we have some people trying, they were working with listening to bolero music and trying just to come up with shapes that represent how bolero was, bolero means to them. So that was when, that was the second part, we did the food, the with the music, and then we move on to the individual project, which uh, each one of them were, uh, we were reading a lot, a lot. <laughs> I don't know if there any of them are here, I'm sorry, but I'm happy that you read all everything I gave you. <laughs> and then you have time to design as well. So the individual approach is the first one, a couple ones, this one deal, dealt with tradition and in Puerto Rico we have this, um, uh, how you call it? Mundillo, which works with, these little sticks are called bolillos and this is a really specific way of moving them in order to create patterns but there's so many, so little amount of people that do this in the island so my student wanted to create a, a collection that will dig, digitalize these patterns. So she started looking at patterns and make, vectorizing them and then she created a book. And so that was part of it and then she's like, I want to create a digital experience based on how Mundillo works. So what she did was she created this uh, interface that you move the bolillos on top of some weird machine and it creates patterns, right? That's not a defined pattern, but it was more based on like, how do I work with the, the technique that the mundillo is. Then I have other students trying to, uh, she called it like decolonizing how we use a website interface, but at the same time teaching you about traditional Chinese folk music. So you will interact with it the, the other way around and then when you click on some on a one color, something pops out, but then the other colors come on, and there's a sound playing. It was a, it was a prototype, uh, and then students working with gender. The students was trying to uh, decolonize the concept of masculinity. So he started researching. The first step that he did was researching 
um, men do and then whatever Google will pop, it will come out and you know when you put those prompts on Google you get the weirdest answers so he went through this process, he started developing, combining patterns about what he considered was masculine and feminine on the cliches and it's like let me play with the cliches first to see what happens less after and then he came up with this piece that was actually printed on a fabric a fabric that just re summarizes everything that he was trying to do and what men should be able to do and uh, so that was it it was printed on this really long fabric so that was uh, with gender then we have other students working with appropriation and just calling out uh, white artists that appropriate black culture and black music and they just profit from it and they build this they design it in a way that people put medals medals and like awards I mean we don't do that so I was really confused but I know like <laughs> they do like these boxes with glass and you put like your kids first baseball something like that so she, she was based on that in order to create this new queens of appropriation then students that were working with resistance and these students uh, develop an uh, actual uh, face mask for a future revolution and that's, those are the sketches and the way she, what things that was she got, uh, a gas mask things that, was, that she was considering was what materials do we use thinking about the user which is going to be the person participating on the revolution what is comfortable for the face that is going to allow me to breathe but at the same be in front of the fight <laughs> and she, she built a couple prototypes so that's the one, one of the prototypes and it had that, the front, you're supposed to change it and then I have no idea what you want to write in there but it was part of a bigger collection that was called Antidote so yeah, so those are a few of the individual projects and then the last thing that I'm going to talk about was the Visual Culture Mural which was the final project this was based on me going back to my roots and thinking about how we used to do posters in Puerto Rico and a lot of parts of the world which was with carving on linoleum and printing on rice paper so that was the technique that I gave the students and then they had to research visual culture in Puerto Rico the first thing they did was to do a sketch of a house in the, in the mountains, Casa de Campo and they did this sketch then they divided it in, in 12, had 12 students and each one of them took a piece of the house home so at the end it was modular and it should, when put together it should build the house again so these are some of the sketches that they did they were trying, oh, each design is trying to uh, also just showcase the visual language of the island and how beautiful it is and so let me see some other like animals related some other with the Taino indigenous sim symbols some students went to the island while in class and they brought a lot of pictures so that was it, then they were some of them have never carved linoleum in, this, in their lives so then they were printing on it we share, share all costs, we bought a bunch of ink and we just it was like a group effort to be able to do it and so that's how we look at the end so each one of them created like a unique piece that is just like, I, and they, they got so excited that they started mixing media some of them have like newspaper costs, some of them went to their printer and then print with the linoleum and it was really really like they were so excited with the process and that's us, these are my kids from last semester really proud of them uh, yeah, thank you very much and I'll leave you that question